thought we'd talk about uh, Postgres XL, give a quick, um, provide some background about it, provide uh, an architectural overview, so uh, talk about all the components that uh, make up a cluster. Um, also show how to distribute um, your tables. Distributing your data is really important for determining um, uh, how, how it will perform. Um, different strategies give you better performance than others. Um, we'll also talk, actually the order slight, slight, I changed it slightly, but we'll talk about how to configure, I'll do a, a small demo to show you how to configure a cluster. Uh, we'll walk through those steps and then I'll, I'll, I'll initialize a small cluster and run some sample queries to show you how that works. And um, yeah, we'll talk about uh, the differences to Postgres and uh, the community. Um, I help co-organize the New York City um, Postgres uh, user group. Um, I've been working on different pro um, projects within the Postgres community, um, Grid SQL, Postgres XC, and now Postgres XL. I've worked for different um, Postgres database related companies um, over the last several years. So Postgres XL, it's a scale out relational database. Um, what's kind of unique about it is it can support multiple different types of workloads. You know, there are different, uh, it tends to be you can use one project or another for um, the scaling out. Um, for different workloads. Postgres XL actually does a pretty good job for both. Like, so there's MPP style parallelism for OLAP um, type of queries um, and workloads, um, but it also scales for OLTP for both read and write scalability. Um, and while doing this across the cluster, you know, the, the nodes aren't independent. It's not, it's not like you shard it and then they're all independent. If, if you do that, there might be some, um, uh, consistency anomalies, it's fully acid with um, all of the data nodes that are involved. Um, there's some other small changes that we've made, like multi-tenant security. Um, you know, typically you can query a PG database and uh, say and see all the list of databases that are there, but we, we lock that down. You can only see your own databases that you uh, created. Um, and Postgres Excel, actually you could act as a, a distributed key value store uh, with um, asset properties, too. Um, so I talked about the different types of workloads. That means you can use it as an operational data store or for mixed workload environments. Um, so in a way, its flexibility would allow you to use it, whether you're doing transaction processing, you need a key value store, data warehousing, um, it's all suited to that. And we, we try to really support as much SQL as we can. Like, uh, sometimes in some of these sharded solutions, they may say, oh, well, we don't support um, correlated subqueries, for example. Um, it's OK. You, you can throw um, that at uh, Postgres XL. There are, you, you may run into some things that we don't support, like um, uh, recursive CTEs uh, you know, with the with clause. Um, if they're recursive, uh, we support some, uh, sim simple ones. Um, so Postgres XL, the main feature is being ACID and scaling out. Uh, we've taken Postgres's multi-version concurrency control and made it work cluster-wide. Uh, uh, we try to take advantage of the community, so a lot of the Postgres contrib modules, you can do a create extension and it, it will just kind of work. Um, so uh, other features like JSON, text search, uh, I'm sorry, full text search, JSON, although it's 9.2, we, we need to um, update it um, to take advantage of some of the newer features. Um, so there's a lot there to allow you to scale out, but there are some key things uh, that are missing, full disclosure, like there's no notion of built-in high availability. Uh, a lot of times people assume that must be built-in. Um, but if you think of availability without the high in front of it, each component can have a warm standby, just like with, with Postgres, you can have a, a standby um, in, in vanilla Postgres. It's kind of similar here where you can have a standby of everything. It's not, it won't automatically fail over itself though. You'll have to do that. But um, you can uh, um, also you know, write your own monitoring script or uh, do something like we've done before, like using the Corosync Pacemaker tandem 
to look for failures and, and then fail over. Uh, also, it's not easy to um, necessarily reshard automatically. You, you can add nodes after um, you have a cluster up and running, but um, it won't automatically reshard your data. You have to uh, like, like add the node and then do an alter table or create a new table and do an insert select. Um, either of those, alter table, I guess, is easier. Um, so that's also sometimes people assume, oh, I just add a new node and everything's magically resharded. No, you, you have a little bit of work to do. We could make that a little bit easier in the future. Some foreign key and unique constraints are not supported. It will support them when it can. That means, for example, if you choose to replicate a table on each node, we can push down enforcing that on each node. So it will be supported. There are other cases where we, we will let you know, we'll block uh, uh, at creation time you trying to create that constraint if we can't support it. In terms of the performance characteristics, uh, we ran some different tests with some different benchmarks and uh, these are a bit dated, but um, say comparing against Amazon RDS, it kind of maxed out. We were able to um, uh, keep getting better performance as we added more and more concurrency uh, at AWS. Um, for OLTP workloads, uh, we, we have a, in the architecture, we have a coordinator layer and then a layer that has all the data nodes. The coordinator adds about 30% extra overhead. So ideally, with, if we had 10 nodes, you know, taking into account that overhead, we would like to see about seven times the performance. But in reality, we just see, say, six to 6.4 times performance. So it's not gonna be you know, quite linear. As we have more and more connections, we have more open transactions, we have larger snapshots, there's more visibility checking that the um, cluster has to do. Um, there's another benchmark on the kind of, kind of OLAP or data warehousing side uh, based on TPCH, this open source one called DBT3. And uh, for that one, comparing against native Postgres, you kind of see as we add more nodes, the, the query time um, decreases uh, quite a bit. Um, and, and this is where, um, in terms of how it performs, um, if you have a pretty simple schema, like a, a star schema that's common in data warehousing, you can distribute your fact tables across the nodes and replicate your dimensions. And that actually scales pretty, pretty much linearly, pretty, pretty close to that. Um, but, um, you know, I, I've seen cases too where just because you have more nodes, more of the data fits in memory, it's not going to disk. And with more nodes, you, you see even better than linear performance because it doesn't have to go to disk. But if your um, database is already fitting in memory, of, co of course, uh, you, you won't see that. Um, we also ran some tests against MongoDB. Um, comparing, say, inserts, I think MongoDB was a little faster. Selects, they were pretty comparable. Um, doing an update-oriented workload, um, Postgres XL, um, uh, could, could handle that type of workload better than MongoDB in some tests that we did, kind of out of the box, um, basic base configuration. Um, so one of the things we wanted to address with Postgres XL, as I mentioned, was consistency cluster-wide. So Postgres has built in multi-version concurrency control, and essentially what that means is Readers don't block writers, and writers don't block readers. So when uh, a new transaction begins internally in Postgres, it gets a new transaction ID. And then when statements run, um, they get a snapshot of a list of the internal transaction IDs. So as it's processing the data, it's always going to, or trying to fulfill a query, get a same, the same view, a consistent view of the data. Um, now, when you run this, uh, how, how um, even just in regular Postgres, say we have a series of transactions um, that run, what normally happens, you know, transaction one begins, transaction two begins, three begins, and then at some point, say, transaction two commits, and transaction four, when it starts running, 
you know, of course, it's, it's going to see um, the data um, uh, in, in T2 uh, since it's committed, but not yet T1 and T3, even if they're in the process of updating data. Since they haven't committed, we can't see it. Um, if you try to roll your own custom sharded solution, where you have multiple nodes and you're trying to run uh, distributed transactions, you, you risk that, that there could be some consistency anomalies. If, say, um, transaction two um, did that commit right about the same time that uh, um, on T4 uh, a new select began, it could be that you know, it committed on node one and, and then node two. Meanwhile, on T4, it started running the select immediately after that commit, but the select started running before the commit on um, node two. So that select, it, it would violate the C in ACID. It wouldn't be getting a consistent uh, view of the data. Um, but so for Postgres XL, the way we solve this problem is we make transaction IDs and snapshots cluster wide. If those internal transaction IDs are, are, are the same cluster wide, we know that um, what, what's associated with what, regardless of what node it's on. And when statements run using a snapshot, we'll, we're always going to uh, get a consistent view of the data. So here's sort of what the um, main components look like. And I'll, I'll break this down and go into more detail. But I, I just wanted to throw it up here before I break it down a little bit more, where there's a global transaction manager, uh, a coordinator layer, and data notes where the user data is actually stored. So what we essentially did was um, we took standard Postgres and we broke out kind of the transaction handling piece of it, the, the proc array, um, if you've uh, hacked around in the code at all, and, and moved that stuff out to this new entity called the GTM, or Global Transaction Manager. And then for the coordinator, we took the, the top level stuff of parsing and planning, um, as well as making sure it has a catalog uh, of all the um, uh, database objects. And then for the data nodes, um, that's where the end user data is actually stored and, and where we execute things. So essentially, the coordinator manages state and passes things down, and the data nodes just do uh, what they're told. Uh, the coordinators also um, combine final uh, result sets from the data nodes. If uh, more than one node's involved, it will implicitly use two-phase commit. And uh, again, it has its own copy of um, the PG catalog. Uh, as mentioned, the data nodes store the actual user tables and indexes. Um, but they aren't overly intelligent. They just, uh, it, it, things are, are not, Statements are not reparsed on the data nodes at all. A plan is sent down, and it, it does what the coordinator is instructed to. Uh, was there a question earlier? OK, sorry. Um, so gl the global transaction manager will handle all this and, and keep things um, consistent. So that means at the beginning of transactions um, that come into the coordinator and statements, there's going to be a lot of communication going on uh, between um, the coordinator and the global transaction manager. And as um, uh, DML comes in, as data is, is brought into the cluster, that's uh, going to get, according to the definition of the tables, it's, it's going to be spread out amongst the data nodes. And then w when you query, it'll, it'll um, perform the operations in parallel and uh, consolidate them and uh, try to get the data back faster. And again, while doing all this, GTM is ensuring consistency. So uh, with a lot of moving parts and things looking complex, it does add a little bit more risk. We want to make sure that um, uh, things can stay up. So GTM kind of looks like a single point of failure. But w there's another entity we added here called the GTM standby. Uh, so the GTM standby is, is kept up to date about what all the um, current transactions are that are running in the cluster. 
Um, another concern in, in looking at that um, uh, diagram of or architecture is it it's kind of seems like GTM could also be a bottleneck. Um, every single state, every single transaction and statement has to interact with um, the GTM. So to get around that problem, we have this new object or this other entity called the GTM proxy. And essentially the way that works is, you know, say you have a couple hundred connections to a coordinator and 10 simultaneously say, you know, begin, begin transaction. Um, instead of talking directly to the GTM, they'll talk to the proxy. It speaks the same protocol, so it looks like a GTM, but it'll group those together and just send one request across the network and um, you know, lock that critical section of code briefly and, and grab a chunk of 10 at once and then send it back to GTM proxy, which um, distributes it back. Um, so this cuts down on um, network activity um, reduces having to lock that critical section of code uh, as much and just makes it um, run more efficiently. In terms of um, data distribution, uh, there are a couple of strategies you can use in how to uh, place your data. You can choose to have some data is completely replicated, so an exact replica can appear on all nodes or a subset of nodes. Um, this kind of makes sense for your static data, your lookup data, you know, state codes, things like that. Uh, so it's, it's good for read-only, read-mainly tables. Um, if you're doing data warehousing, it's good for dimension tables uh, so that it can join with larger fact tables. Um, and we also employ some um, improvements like uh, although logically in that diagram I showed the coordinator and data node separately, they really can be co-located on the same server. Um, so you can configure it so it knows if, it's, if we're attached to a coordinator and we're looking up a replicated table, just connect to the local instance. Uh, don't go across the network. Um, so re but replicated tables will be bad for uh, write-heavy workloads. Um, each of those updates has to go to every single node if you're doing that. So um, if it's a very active write-heavy table, you, you don't want to use it. And we uh, do some things to try to avoid deadlocks on those. Um, other tables you can choose to distribute where there's not, um, where it's not an exact replica of the table, but the, ta the, um, the data is spread out amongst multiple nodes. And this is better for write-heavy uh, tables. So instead of one single node just being hammered with writes, you can spread that workload amongst multiple nodes uh, and get better, better total throughput that way. It's also good, though, for in data warehousing, if you have these uh, um, tables with hundreds of millions or billions of rows, you know, just spread them out amongst multiple nodes so that when they're queried, they can be queried in parallel. Um, and in terms of how to distribute the data, you, you can choose how you want to do it. Uh, hash makes sense because we can map it to a particular node, um, but we, uh, there are also a couple of other methods provided, like round robin. Um, say, you know, you, it might be you have a table with a single column. It's really log. Maybe it's log data. Kind of doesn't make sense to bother calculating the hash on it. It's not really going to be used as a key. In that case, it will just try to evenly spread out the data. And the planner tries to take advantage of all this information to come up with an intelligent plan to uh, execute it as, as uh, efficiently as possible. So again, high availability isn't built in, but you, you can set up standbys. And it, it will just take a one-line command to say, you know, node failover. Um, to bring it up. And uh, if you come up with your own manual scheme, you can also even set up multiple uh, replicas for more redundancy. Like you could have one node, have on node one, have a primary and have a replica on, sorry, server two and three. On server two, uh, have a replica on server three and four and, and so on. So how this looks when you, when you go to create the tables is we just modified the create table statement. 
we add an additional clause um, at the end, a distribute by clause. It's actually optional. Um, if you don't include it, we try to pick a reasonable way of distributing uh, the table based on any primary keys you've included or unique column constraints. Um, but uh, otherwise, I think typically you're better off explicitly defining. You know your data. You know how your tables are going to be used. It makes sense for you to define um, what your distribution strategy is. So for example, for a state code table, you want to replicate it on every node. Just add distribute by replication at the end of it. Say you had an invoice table with many, many invoices. Uh, you could choose to distribute hash distribute by invoice ID. It'll you'll end up with a pretty even distribution uh, across all the nodes. Um, as a more complex example, let's say for that invoice we had a bunch of line items. Um, it, we could say distribute the line items on that invoice by um, the line item ID column. That's fine but there's a foreign key on invoice ID to the parent invoice. And um, we, we know that these are going to be being joined together a lot. Or we, say we know our application where, because that's a foreign key to the primary key. So um, instead, it makes sense on line item to go ahead and distribute by the foreign key of invoice ID. That way, whenever we run queries that join these two tables together, it's just going to push that join down. So to show, uh, do, do all of you here, how many people use the explain command? OK. That's, so I'll show you a couple um, explain output examples to, to get an idea of how this works, how this looks different internally. So let's say we had a couple of tables, T1 and T2, distributed by call 1 and call 3, respectively. If we have a query that joins on those two um, distribution columns, the explain plan is going to look pretty much like a Postgres um, explain, explain output. It's just going to include um, uh, data node information, where it's pushing it down to. Um, it's very similar. But if we change this up a, a little bit and make one of the join columns a non-distribution column, then the plan changes. It looks a little bit different. Um, instead, what we have here uh, when, when it's, um, I guess, doing a sequential scan on T1, it knows that T2 that it's um, being joined with is hash distributed on call 3, which is a join condition. So it's actually going to um, distribute the results um, by that. So data is going to get shipped around directly, data node to data node. Um, and uh, uh, move data to where it can be joined locally and only move as much data that needs to be moved to fulfill the query. So yeah, the purpose of this is just to point out, you know, we've spent a lot of time in the um, planner and executor to try and efficiently handle all these different scenarios and stress the importance of thinking about how you uh, lay out your data. Um, I also want to mention, so Postgres does not have query, query parallelism yet. That's kind of a, a, a topic going on where I, I, that's coming soon. But um, you could use Postgres Excel um, today to help you with that. Uh, so today with regular vanilla Postgres, let's say you have a 16-core server and you just have one user running one query. Maybe it has to look through a lot of data, I don't know, hundreds of gigabytes. Um, Someone has, you know, some reporting user, they have the machine to themselves, even though, so it'll go off and query, but it's pretty much just going to use one core, and you're going to have 15 idle cores sitting there, which is uh, not, not the ideal situation with Postgres. But with Postgres Excel, it's possible to configure uh, multiple data nodes. Uh, on that same server. You think of it not as a physical unit, but more of a logical unit. Um, with multiple of those configured, uh, we can get all those cores working and, and uh, churning through that data and uh, getting your query results back faster. Uh, like I think in one test I did on an, uh, an eight-core box, 
Um, yeah, I think I ran some uh, TPCH type of queries, and they were typically because there there was some um, sharing. Of, you know, there's some sharing of resources, of course, memory, storage, and whatnot. But um, for the my sample workload, like it was about five times faster. So it's not going to be eight times faster necessarily. Uh, depends uh, also on on your hardware, but you can definitely get a boost taking advantage of um, having more of those cores available. Okay, um, so some differences uh, of uh, Postgres Excel to Postgres itself. Um, we've made some modifications to the catalog. There's a new table, uh, PGXC node, um, just contains information about coordinators and data nodes and how they're defined. Um, there's PGXC class. Instead of it being in PG class, here we, we store uh, table uh, replication or distribution information. We've also added a variety of commands to help manage the cluster. For example, pause and, and unpause cluster. Um, if you do that, it'll, it'll try to wait for currently executing transactions to finish and block any new activity from occurring. And uh, that, that's kind of nice. It, it, it would allow you to, to say, since the users are connected to the coordinators and, and not the um, data nodes, you could say, pause it, the user, um, the applications don't lose their connections, and then say behind the scenes you decide to move a node or fail over, maybe you have streaming replication set up for a data node, you know, promote another one, and then you can continue the cluster, and the user um, will have no idea that that actually happened. Um, so, so that's useful. We also have some other things that are mainly helpful in, in development and debugging. Execute Direct kind of bypasses the coordinator layer. That's to run a command directly on a node in case you want to see what's going on on a particular node. Um, we, since we have all these connections uh, going on between all these um, uh, different nodes, we take advantage of connection pooling so uh, we can free connections with the clean connection command. And then uh, defining nodes, we have a cr create node and alter node command. So there are a, a few differences. We also have a utility to clean up. Um, since we implicitly create, use two-phase commit in some cases when we need to, there's a little utility for cleaning those up in case, say, a crash happened of a data node in the middle of um, a commit. And there might be a prepared but not committed transaction around. If you do feel like going and lo looking at the code, it's pretty easy to see um, what, what has changed in the code. Just look for these if defs. Um, I think recently we haven't been as strict, in the, um, but for the most part, you can pretty much fairly easily see, oh, OK, here's how they, they did that and modified the Postgres code. Um, so the community, you, you can go to uh, this website, postgresxl.org, um, to uh, there, find online documentation, links to um, support or SourceForge. Um, we actually would like to move it over to, uh, to GitHub instead of SourceForge. Uh, we should be doing that uh, in the near future. Uh, again, docs online, uh, you can go to files.post. Um, postgresxl.org. So what we'd like to do moving forward on the roadmap, unfortunately, we, we're still on a 9.2 base. We, I know it's starting to show its age a little bit there. We, we have to get caught up. Um, so we, we want to catch up to the Postgres community. And um, Second Quadrant has um, uh, expressed their intent to support this effort um, so that we can uh, try to catch up uh, very soon here. And um, we'd also like to make Excel a more robust analytical plat platform. Postgres has foreign data wrappers, so um, we think we should be able to leverage this and, and take advantage of distributed foreign data wrappers where we could get the, um, if you have a sharded data source, um, uh, teach Postgres Excel about that so the individual data nodes could pull in the external data in parallel. 
could also be a set of Hadoop files sitting around in HDFS where you can give it a list and we could pull that in and process that in parallel. Um, so uh, we're, we're excited to uh, work on that feature. Um, like to change sharding. Uh, instead of having standbys uh, for the individual data nodes, uh, move kind of break the one-to-one -one mapping of shard to node where we can have multiple shards in multiple locations. Uh, that'll give us a little bit more flexibility for high availability as well. And, you know, uh, you saw a chart earlier with this um, kind of complicated, somewhat complicated looking architecture perhaps. You know, if you're doing data warehousing where you just have a simple bulk load, util um, bulk load process once a night or something, uh, you, you may not, you don't care so much. You may, you really don't need GTM. If it's not a, a highly write concurrent workload, you, you could live without it. So uh, we, we could turn that off. Um, and also native high availability. This is probably the number one complaint uh, that we hear. People really want to use this uh, with high availability, um, but uh, that, that's going to be a, a bit of an effort. Um, any questions so far before I jump into how to configure a cluster? Yes. Is this a, hard, a software only solution or do you guys provide the, the hardware? It's an open source software project, yeah. Okay. Um, how does this work with, uh, like you mentioned that you can have uh, multiple, uh, you can have just one uh, server and still use the file movement. How does it provide yeah, so you just affect it instead of installing a data node on another server, you could say install four data nodes or eight data nodes on the same server. Um, you can configure it that they each run off of a different port. And then to the coordinator, uh, when you configure this, you can specify pretty much a host and port number. So the coordinator is just going to connect to the local instances that are running. Um, yeah, and those will work in, in parallel. So you'll get the CPU parallelism, but they, you know, they're sharing other computing resources on that same box. Can you talk about how the batching has been modified to work on Yeah, sure. Um, in the early days, so this was based on another project called Postgres XC, and in the um, when we were doing testing with XC, we did see a pro because transaction IDs are shared. If there's one long running vacuum, it actually impacted the other servers. Because there more visibility checking has to be done. It's yeah. Um, so we made a modification. Like I talked about the transaction IDs uh, and snapshots being shared. Um, the the modification that we made there was is uh, we differentiated for GTM what's a, um, a transaction ID request for a vacuum. And then we made it local to only that node. Um, so ba basically, um, it's only going to affect snapshots local on that machine and not the others. Because we know this transaction ID is only going to be used on this one machine and not the other. So um, yeah, it won't impact the a long running vacuum on one node won't impact the other nodes necessarily. Um, because yeah, in the early days of testing, we did see, you know, at some point there was some long vacuum and then we saw performance decrease. And after we made this change, it became this smaller blip instead of a deeper uh, downward spike. So good question. Is the shared XID architecture, I mean, does that limit the growth of the cluster theoretically? Um, I haven't tested on enough nodes, but I would guess at some point, you're going to be doing a lot of visibility checking, potentially. Yeah. Where that limit is, I, I don't know. I mean, for, uh, you know, say, I, what, I don't know what type of, I guess you're thinking more of a write concurrency workload. Yeah, yeah so for that, you know, with 10 nodes, um, ideally, we should have seen seven times the performance. We saw six to 6.4 times the performance. So I'm not, it, it's definitely flattening. Uh, where that limit is, though, haven't gone out to enough nodes to know. Okay. Yes? Yeah, there, uh, 
I think it depends on your workload. Like, um, if it's if it's right, uh, a highly right concurrent workload, there may be some limit at some point. You have so many open transactions, and the database might have to check all these. You can pr perhaps put PG Bouncer in front of it, actually, which which could help. Uh, um, could help quite a bit, actually. Um, we we haven't tried that out yet. Uh, in terms of running tests that way. Um, if you have a workload, say, where it's, um, you know, you're using it to load balance reads, where it's a read mainly workload, I think there, there really isn't a whole, I, I would think that um, that would scale pretty well. Or if it's uh, data warehousing where it's low concurrency and you just really, and maybe you just have one big fact table and you just want to take advantage of parallelism, then, um, uh, you know, you could probably add many, many, many nodes. So I think it kind of depends on the workload. Yes? Uh, have you looked into three phase commits? No, I haven't. Um, we. My professor ends up saying there is some rare locking conditions that happen when you do two phase versus three phase commits. Maybe yeah. one, one, one failure from phase two commits or one additional failure from phase two commits. Mm -hmm. No, we've just um, tried to leverage what's available to us through the Postgres code for that part and took advantage of the built-in two-phase commit capability. Uh, all right, I'll go into the configuration, then at the end I can answer more questions if there are any. Um, in terms of configuration, um, it didn't show up so well. Um, if you configure your own cluster, which we can, I can go through the steps. It's, you know, you think there's all these components, this must be really hard and complicated. And on the mailing list, people do report issues um, where they, or they, not issues, they try to configure and they, they have problems with it. So you start with a simple configuration first, and then once you get that working, then build out a, a more complex configuration. Um, like I recommend at the beginning, use one GTM, one coordinator, and two data nodes. And then from there, you can add more data nodes, add GTM proxies and standbys. Um, but just getting something up and running with a simpler config will get you familiar with um, all the uh, components. So there's a utility to make this easier. It's called PGXCCTL. You're probably familiar with PGCTL um, for Postgres. So uh, uh, kind of um, based on that uh, idea. Um, if you want to do it manually, which I strongly discourage, there are init DB type steps, like there's init GTM for GTM. You can manually configure each component. It's, it's cumbersome. Uh, we have extra config parameters that uh, you don't see in Postgres. Since we take advantage of pooling, you can set pool sizes and timeouts. Um, for planning, we cost out um, we want to take into account how expensive it is to ship data across the network because we get the data nodes talking to each other. So we have some costing parameters. If you, if your network is particularly slow or whatever, and you want to make that more expensive, um, although in general we strongly bias against plants that are going to generate lots of data to ship around. Um, uh, the nodes have to know where GTM is, so you got to configure the host and port. There, for row shipping, we use something called shared queues, um, and so you configure how much of your shared memory you want to uh, uh, use for that to to buffer those for sh um, shipping. Um, as I mentioned, uh, if if you want to install it um, yourself, go you you. Well, you could use these RPMs. I'm, I didn't quite make it, but we, we wanted to put out some new RPMs uh, before today. Um, th that includes some bug fixes that have been, the mailing list is pretty active. Uh, people are regularly um, uh, providing feedback. We want, uh, so we, we have some bug fixes if you, if you grab the latest from Git that you can take advantage of. Um, so if you do it yourself, you know it's like Postgres in terms of configure, make, make, install. Uh, if you use this tool, PGXCCTL, you want to set up um, SSH, otherwise you're going to get all these prompts and it's, it's going to be annoying uh, where it's uh, prompting you for a password as you're trying to run things on remote systems. 
So if you've set this up before, this will look pretty familiar. Otherwise, there's something in the documentation on how to uh, set up SSH keys. Anyway, PGXC, PGXC CTL will allow you to initialize a cluster, start, stop it, deploy to a new cluster, add a new coordinator, add a new data node, add a slave for a data node, add a GTM standby, um, et cetera. So let's look at how to configure uh, a fairly basic cluster of one GTM, one coordinator, and two data nodes. The main thing to keep in mind, or the main thing that trip people up is they configure their port conflicts, basically data nodes or pooler ports um, are conflicting. The utility does go through this and try to look for conflicts and warn you. It, it won't try to, say, initialize a new cluster if it detects a, um, a port conflict. Um, so some of the basic settings are you, you give it an owner and then where um, Excel is installed. Uh, you configure uh, where GTM is, what the host is, and, and data directory, uh, whether it's the master or slave. In this case, it's, uh, we just want the master. Um, for a single coordinator, uh, tell it the directory, give it a name, port, pooler port, some wall info. Um, for data nodes, in this case, if, if we have two, and now maybe it makes more sense why we, um, there are parentheses there. So we essentially have a list. Um, so you can list out, um, you know, what, what the values are for, for each of these two. So once you've done all that, essentially all you have to do is, is run this command, pgxcctl in it all, and then it will go off and, um, uh, initialize a cluster. And uh, I can do that here. Kind of demo that. I think I, I have a slightly uh, modified version here. Um, essentially, I took the content um, that's on those slides. I, I'm using a different directory, but it's pr pretty similar. Um, if you set all that up in a config file, we just need to run pgxc, let me make sure, I don't think I have one running. Just run pgxc ctl in it all and it will go and, and initialize things. Now you might see a couple messages like not found, port, it's basically checking, oh, is, you know, is there something running already? Has it already initialized the data directory yet? Those are benign um, error messages. Okay, so what this did was it went and um, initialized GTM, one coordinator, uh, two data nodes. So now we can run, um, actually, let me pull this up a little bit so you guys can see better for those of you in the back. So I can run, use uh, the, the Postgres psql um, command line utility and uh, create tables. Actually, I'll enable timing here. I can specify a distribution clause. I'll insert a few rows here. So it looks pretty much just like uh, Postgres. Um, behind the scenes, what's happening is if I run that execute direct command I talked about earlier, where I bypass the coordinator layer, um, they, because of the hash distribution, it looks like on data node one, we got a couple of rows. On data no node two, we have the other ones. Um, you can also run this, run it this way. There's a special uh, uh, value column you can use here. It's uh, that might not be in the friendliest uh, terms there, the XC node ID. But here you can see that um, 
the identifiers are different, um, so it's actually on running on two different nodes. Um, we can also create replicated tables. Oops, replication. And here, if I run those execute direct commands, we should see it on both of those. So in that case, we do see it on both because we told it, hey, you know, rep replicate on both. Um, I think I got about five minutes left for any questions about that or any of the stuff earlier. So the standby for the GPM, mm -hmm. It's just uh, communication, uh, TPC, sending it over as new transactions are, uh, new XIDs are allocated and closed. It's sending that over to the standby. And you can configure, I believe, uh, whether or not you want that to be synchronous or not, but in terms of waiting for a reply back from the other. Yes? It would be exactly the same. It would behave the same. It's just that um, in the config file, uh, so here I just happen to configure on that top line, um, you know, a list of where I want the data notes. In this case, I put them both on local host. It could have been, you know, host one and host two. And then if I set up um, those SSH keys, um, instead of running in it all, I would have ran one more step before called deploy all. Um, I had already got this installed, but say if it wasn't installed on that second machine, um, if I ran deploy all, it would have taken the binary actually and then moved it over um, in the same location um, on the other system. And then it would, uh, at, at, in at all time then, it would have you know, made sure it ran over on the other system. And uh, yeah, otherwise it's pretty much the same. It then the coordinator uh, has a pooler and um, it's any of those, like those create table statements and whatnot, it's just gonna grab a pool based on the definition, whether it's a local host or a remote host and according to what port we configured. Yes? Um, do you have a qualitative understanding of sort of how many people are doing this as like a POC, how many people are doing this as a prediction, or is it hard to really understand? Uh, I think I just have a rough idea because, yeah, being open source, people can download it and use it. I have done a, a couple of trainings for um, people that are um, doing POCs and things like that. Um, I am, the mailing list is pretty active of people um, using it and reporting issues. Um, I have heard of uh, other people using it like uh, uh, banks even and um, uh, social networking companies in Asia. Um, yeah. Thanks. Sure. Yeah, it, we, we modify the code directly, so it's not something you can really lay over onto Postgres. We modify the core Postgres code itself, so it's almost yeah, I don't want to say it's a fork, but yeah, I mean, it's a different version of Postgres, yeah, that we've modified. And currently on, on 9.2.4. Yeah, any other questions? Okay, thanks. If you have any other questions, feel free to ask me later.